Welcome everybody to this week's Mindful Social Marketing with Shanali Burke. And, you know, Shanali has been a really good friend of mine for a long time. And when I think of people who really get social media and get PR, I think about Shanali. So I'm thrilled that she's here to talk about social PR this week. And I see we've got a lot of PR friends and a lot of mindful friends in the audience. So Shanali, why don't you say hello and tell us a little bit about you for the like three people who don't know you already. <laughs> Hi, everyone. It's so nice to see you. I, I'm seeing a lot of friends here, which is awesome. Thank you guys for making the time to join us today. I'm Shanali Burke. For those of you who don't know me, I am a social PR strategist, trainer, and teacher based out of the DC area. But as they say, have MacBook, will travel. Cannot travel with that mic, unfortunately, but, you know, some's got to give. Um, I'm very grateful to have the life that I do, which is really to a large extent because of social media and the connections that we are able to make through social networks, which is why I really cottoned on to this concept of social PR. Because PR is not just about putting your message out there or getting the word out or generating buzz. It's really about socializing your story, building and motivating communities to share your story for you. And that's where my work led me over the last several years. And that's what I do. So in addition to my consulting practice, where I take on limited clients, um, really for in-depth strategy development, audits, that kind of stuff, I teach at Johns Hopkins and Rutgers Universities, which I'm very grateful to do. Um, I do a lot of speaking and training workshops. And I also just recently launched my own online training programs at socialprvirtuoso.com. Janet, you are such an inspiration. And I remember you and I connected, oh gosh, I would say in the fairly early days of social, I think, as far as PR went. And where we really got to know each other was through the Blue Key campaign. Oh, yes. Why don't you tell people a little bit about the Blue Key campaign and, and what you started there? Because I think that was a real breakthrough for really doing PR in a very social way. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so the Blue Key campaign was an initiative from USA for UNHCR, which is a nonprofit based here in D.C., and they raise funds and awareness around refugee issues. The issue that they had, even though the mission is so worthy. Oh, hey, Rob. Hey, Gary. Um, even though the mission is so worthy, you know, refugees, the subject matter doesn't lend itself to easy sharing because most people don't know about them. You might see refugees walking around you, but you don't know that they're refugees because they integrate so well. So they came to us and wanted a digital strategy designed and implemented to really help raise awareness of the organization, of refugee issues, and really to get people thinking about what it means to be without a home due to no fault of your own. So we came up with this concept called the Blue Key Champion Strategy, and we figured if you have a population, refugees, who don't have a voice then what you need to do to get the word out about that is to find people who have a voice and who are willing to lend that voice to these faceless, voiceless people. And that's who our Blue Key champions were. So Janet was one of them. Beth Cantor was one. Um, the, pretty much anyone who's anyone <laughs> in, in social and in the nonprofit space, I'm very grateful, signed on to the campaign. And, you know, we really just had very two simple asks, uh, two very simple asks, which was, Please buy a key because it was five bucks. It was a it was a pin or pendant that was about that big in the shape of a blue key from the microsite and post one blog post about the campaign. But we really focus on building a community among these champions so that they felt energized and motivated about the cause. And it just it was it was amazing. I mean, there's no way we could have predicted how it would take off. And I think that's something that happens with campaigns. If you allow them to breathe and grow, then, and you really focus on building a community and empowering that community, it does things that you just simply cannot do on your own. And that to me, I mean, I like you said, Janet, I think that was a real breakthrough. I think that was really, that was social PR. I mean, that was living, breathing, organic social PR. And it's amazing. We did all of that without paid stuff. I mean, I, the organization may have had some some paid stuff, but our stuff was all organic. It was all content based. And it was all conversation based. And it was all community based. Right. It was pretty, it was pretty amazing. It really was. And it was amazing to it participate really because so many people 
got engaged uh, with it. Got engaged and, with it. you know, that, that yeah. was just amazing. Yeah. Um, a lot of people talk now about influencer marketing. And that was kind of an early version of influencer marketing. And I think it was done really right because you really empowered people. People took, you know, turns at hosting an hour of the Twitter chat and the ongoing chat that was going on. And so it really gave them a way to be vested in it. So what kind of tips can you share with us for finding people who have real influence and getting them to engage for your cause? I would like to give a shout out to Tracker, T-R-A-A-C-K-R. They have been my client, and I don't know if technically they still are or not, but just consider yourselves disclosed. <laughs> uh, because for the last year or so, year and a half maybe almost, we've been working on and, and just recently launched the Academy of Influencer Marketing. Mm -hmm. um, so if you go to tracker.com, you'll find a link from there or I think it might be education.tracker.com. And it was really, really interesting working on this. You know, so it's a wonderful course that we've created and several different levels of it. And I use Tracker all the time. And I started using them way back. In fact, that was one of the programs we used for the Blue Key campaign. They gave it to me free of charge, which is such a wonderful thing right. to do. Um, and I think, you know, the, the yes, that's exactly it, Kate. Thank you, education.tracker.com. Um, Kate just dropped it in the in the chat uh, stream. Great. The most important thing Thanks. about finding the right influencers is finding contextual influencers. Because I think after a certain point, there you go. Thank you so much. Uh, after a certain point, you know, once one, if one has been active in the social space or any kind of, of digital sphere, you build up a presence, you build up followers you know you're recognized as having a certain amount of reach and and so on um but that doesn't mean that you are relevant to every campaign right. or to every niche and i think one of the worst things that you can do especially if you're really targeting influencers which means you're not just doing spray and pray pr uh, where you spam everyone with a press release or a pitch, AKA which happens old all the time, school. unfortunately. <laughs> okay, yeah, old school. Um, you want to really reach to a limited group of people, but who are going to be so invested in your program or campaign that it makes sense for them to participate. Mm -hmm. And that means that you really have to evaluate the context within which you reach out to them and within which they could participate. So yesterday... I was catching up on work at night. And I got this um, pitch. And like Janet, you get this all the time, I bet. Um, but I got a pitch from somebody at a firm in the UK and um, supposedly the MD of this. What seems to be a very, very decent firm. And they do recruitment. They focus on recruitment, recruitment consulting. And the pitch was... It was like a, a personalized email. That's how it came across. A personalized, personalized, personalized. email. Personalized. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, hi, Shanali, you know, so-and-so. And it was um, inviting me to this webinar that this gentleman was doing on how recruitment consultants are using data. And, and then it said, hey, and by the way, would you be a good sport and tweet this out? Because we don't know you, but, you know. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh, no, you didn't. And I was just so, I, I rarely do this. I almost never, never um, reply <laughs> in a rude or mean way. I'm not rude, but in a mean, snarky way, because really, you know, it's not good energy. But I was just so irritated. It's like, and I could see that it had come through a service. You know, so it was like blasted out through whatever. I'm not going to name them, but but through one of these distribution services. Mm -hmm. And I said, you, who are the idiot marketing people that you have working for you? Because first of all, you have clearly not written this email. Otherwise, you would not have referred to yourself in the third person, <laughs> which is what did, you know, join so-and-so, meaning me, so-and-so, so-and-so on this webinar. B, what is it about my online activity or anything that tells you I would be remotely interested in 
how recruiters are using data. I'm like so totally not interested in that. And C, not only do you not know anything about me, but then you're asking me to do something for you mm -hmm. because of my reach, which is, I mean, it's like, and I was like, literally, you know, it's, it's your name. This is going out in your name from your email address. How can you let somebody do this and impact your reputation? Right. I mean, and you know, uh, who was it? Was it was it TechCrunch that used to do this periodically, the kind of expose, you know, the bad uh, pitches? And there are a few of these online outlets that still do that. And, you know, it sucks when that happens. And really, suck. why set yourself up to do that? It does suck. And, you know, it really is interesting to me that um, these kind of like what you said that, you know, this is representing you. And at the end of the day, you may do something really stupid and spam a whole bunch of people. And it's not the impression of the service that sent it out. It's an impression of you. It's your personal brand. So, you know, taking a mindful approach to how you reach out to people and really getting to know them first and warming up the waters and taking that extra step is absolutely crucial in order to get real influencer engagement. And I even kind of hate the word influencer engagement because it's pandering, for lack of a better word. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and clearly there are a lot of people out there who are influencers and don't have a lot of influence because they send out so much crap and they're so busy uh, promoting other people's products because they've been paid to do it or they've gotten product to do it or whatever that you really don't know who they are anymore. And then nobody, yeah. they're not influencing anybody because we're all like, wow, yesterday it was dog food and today it's candy bars. So you know, <laughs> <laughs> really what's yeah, your name? And and there's not even enough sugar in there to make you go, ooh, dog food, sweet dog food. <laughs> hey, Paula. <Right. laughs> and like, so, and here's the thing, like if these people had done a little bit of research and said, okay, so there's a data angle, right? So they could have said, you know, you're into measurement. Here's how this would be interesting to you. Because then I may have, I probably wouldn't have attended the webinar anyway, because, you know, there's like, 99.96 shitty crap webinars out there that I have absolutely no interest in joining. But I may have said, hey, send me some information or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll, I'll put the word out because I try to help. Sure. So a lot of times sure. people pitch me stuff and I'm like, you know, and I know I get it. I'm getting the whole, the whole, uh, you know, the skyscraper posts and the blah, blah, blah. And, you know, now that now that the roundups, people are used to seeing my roundups. I cannot tell you the number of irrelevant pitches I get for my roundups. And I'm like, oh. but if they're informational posts, and I say, you know what? Not in the roundup, but I'll help you put it out there. And so I'll send it out on Twitter. I share it, as you've seen, in the Posse group or in the Virtuoso group or somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, so there's many ways to help people, but at, at least be on point. And really customizing those emails. You know, you can't yeah. just broadcast a bunch of emails and spray and pray anymore. It doesn't work. <clears throat> yeah. Sorry, my throat. So tell us a little bit more about what makes the difference between traditional PR and let's let's focus that to traditional online PR and social PR and how that's evolved over the last few years. I think it was last week or a week ago, uh, two weeks ago, in, recently, I did a Twitter chat um, and a lot of people, you know, were, this was one of the questions and, um, you know, some people were saying, well, with digital PR, your social PR, you can focus a lot more, you can target a lot more, da, 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 da. and I was thinking, dude, if you're not already targeting, then ugh, I don't want to be on your team because you should, you should know what you're doing. You can't just go out and you know, everyone's not your target audience. So I think what's happening now is that traditional PR consultants, practitioners who have primarily focused on media relations in the past, and that's unfortunately still, I think, the public perception of PR. Um, 
are simply using digital platforms to do the same thing, mm -hmm. which is blanket pitching, not really focusing their outreach and so on, which is, which is kind of like, why, why bother? Because of course, now the tools at our disposal are that we do all of this electronically. I remember back in the day where, you know, certainly we had email, but before then, um, I wasn't, I don't think I was ever pitched before. We certainly use email to communicate, but I definitely remember when we would actually print out press releases and print out media advisories and stuff them and mail them and, and all of that. But our outreach was, good outreach was still one-on-one. -on -one. And that's why we did well, because we really focused on targeting the the outlet, the reporter, customizing the story angle, customizing the pitch, you know, being mindful of what would make them tick and, and, and not. And I think what social PR does is take that to a whole different level because PR has always been about building relationships and the primary stakeholder group we would focus on would be the media. Um, and what the social technologies allow us to do now is really broaden our scope mm -hmm. so that we're not just focusing on building relationships with relevant media, but also with community evangelizers, with influencers, as you said, even though that's not the greatest way to term them, because of the fact that thanks to the way the online space has evolved and self-publishing to a large extent, Pretty much anyone can be an an influencer as long as the context is right. So it's number one, broadening your stakeholder groups and building relationships with multiple groups. You number two, you don't have to go through the media to reach them. You can do it directly. Number three, it is really about socializing the conversation and building communities. I mean, that's just like I, I can't, it's hard for me to really come up with a plan or a strategy that is not socialized. <laughs> that doesn't mean you have to go out and create every single social network with your brand, blah, blah, blah. You know, you still have to be focused, do sufficient. But number four, what's really, really interesting, and I alluded to this earlier, is that we are media ourselves. So how... I mean, look at this. This is media. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're essentially hosting a TV interview with me right now <laughs> through the internet. It's the beauty of And the you're internet. recording it and you it's 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 amazing. So mm -hmm. we have the potential to be that voice, to be that media, which is which is exhilarating and scary because I think it can lead to a lot of confusion, like, oh shit, who do I pitch now? And so says my friend, and do I pitch them or what do I do? And then, then that goes back to the relationship building. So I came up when I, you know, because I've been doing this for a while. And as I started to really conceptualize things, you know, I came up with these seven C's that I call the seven C social PR framework that I, that I unveiled a few months ago. And that's really about using these seven C's to have a really holistic, integrated measurable approach to your communications that involves community, that involves conversation, that involves content to build and motivate communities of influence to tell your story for you. So when you build those communities that tell your story for you, um, what percentage of those are huge influencers who have really big audiences as opposed to people who have small but really engaged audiences? Is there a way to to value that? And to make this question more complicated, is there a way to justify letting the small fish play to the client? What we did during the Blue Key campaign, I go back to that because I think it's a really good example, is <laughs> Paula singing <"Yay>, small fish. <laughs> um, yay, Paula! Um, was because I think that's the first question the clients ask is how, what's their reach? You know, that's, it's a natural question. What's mm -hmm. the reach? Who's their audience? Because they think that automatically, if you get one of those, or a few of those influences on board, your message is going to go all over the place. Um, but what we did and do, if this question arises is do a 
shit ton of research uh-huh. and show the engagement level with the community. Because to us, if we get someone who even though he or she doesn't have great reach, but we see there's a lot of community engagement, a lot of activity with their community, they're going to be much more likely to actually, if they sign on, they're going to be much more likely to share your story, to help you get your word out mm-hmm. and encourage their community to do something. And that's what we looked for with the Blue Key campaign. So, you know, we had some champions who also had very small numbers, you know, a few hundred in terms of a Twitter following as opposed to tw- tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. Um but it didn't matter because they were so engaged with their community and we could see by evaluating their online activity that they really sparked conversation. And that's what we want. We want to look for people who spark mm-hmm. conversations. Um, so I think just kind of doing that research and showing your the client the justification for why you want to include so-and-so. And that might be some battles you have to have to lose. You know, and if they insist on having X number of influencers with, you know, 5,000 followers plus whatever the benchmark is, okay, as long as they're relevant, you know, and as long as, as long as uh, it's not hard to find Mm. those people if you're doing your, if you're doing your research. Um, But as long as you help the client set and manage expectations. So I think that's the second part of your question, as far as I remember, because I've talked to him so much. The first part of your question was, um is there some kind of benchmark in terms of follower numbers or or anything like that was mm-hmm. that the first yep. part of your question mm-hmm. yeah like, i don't have one <laughs> great <laughs> oh, we're done i now. really focus on context i really just look at context um you know and there are so many interesting tools now that you can use to do your research for you you know with tracker and, and again disclosure of, of the client relationship you know, one is interesting feature um, for them is like they have a network mapping tool. So you can actually see who, if somebody's pulled up as an influencer based on the search that you've programmed, you can see who they are influenced by, which can be mm-hmm. very interesting um, because that's what you want, right? You want to you wanna find the right people who are talking to the right people. And the cool and the interesting thing about influencers, as you know, Janet, is that they all talk to themselves. And each other. <laughs> and each other. Say that again. Each other. And each other. Yeah. Well, that's what I meant. Not talk to themselves. Not like, hey, blah, blah, blah. Look at me. That's blah, that's Paris. Uh, talk to the hand. That's, that's <laughs> they talk to each other. Exactly. And the more they talk to each other, then other people hear them talking to each other about this stuff that's going on. And then they start to say, huh, that's interesting. Mark Schaefer was just talking to... Scott Monty about that, and Scott Monty was talking to Christopher Penn, and Christopher Penn was talking to so and so, and it's like, hmm, and that's how it starts mm-hmm. to percolate out. So, I just I think numbers can be so misguided and so misleading unless they are really put into context, and context is unique. You know, your context is not the same as mine, and mine isn't the same as Paula's, isn't the same as Gary's, isn't the same as Rob's. Yeah. And, you know, Gary brought up an interesting point earlier that this is a shit ton of work. This is It's always a lot of work. And, you know, if you're really embedded in it, um, you can start to develop circles of influencer or community of practice, basically, around particular topics. And if you're doing your own PR for your own projects, that's much easier because it's something that you're passionate about. It's something that you're interested in. And so you start to gravitate towards those people. You start conversations. And pretty soon you've got a community of practice that you can tap into when you need help or you need support. But for brands, that's very different. And for agencies like ours, it's really different because you have to wear so many hats. You have to be interested in so many things, which is one of the things that I find amazing and fabulous is that I have clients that, you know, I can find out about wine. I can find out about food. I can find out about jogging and strollers and kids and all of these different things. And I love that about what we do. But it's also a lot harder because you have to have a lot more hands and a lot more pots. And I think that's where, and this isn't a tracker sales pitch, but I think that's where tracker has finally hit upon that. Because what's crucial 
isn't the influencer themselves. It's the people that they influence. And if the people that they influence care about what it is that you're doing and what it is that you're trying to market, then that influencer is valuable to you. But if they're not, then get somebody else. Absolutely. And I think that's also, you know, thinking about, because let's, let's, let's face it, PR comes from persuasion mm -hmm. theory. So whether we like it or not, if we're in this business of communication, which we are, you know, whether one identifies as a marketer or as a social media strategist, however you identify, ultimately it comes down to the fact that we have objectives, businesses have objectives, and it's our job as practitioners or as agencies or consultants or strategists to help identify the ways those businesses can connect with their audiences, connect with their stakeholder groups, and start to become of value, be seen of value, so that ultimately we move towards behavior change and we're looking at outcomes and we're able to help affect outcomes. I think last week I was doing Sally Falco's digital PR uh, chat and we were talking about measurement. And uh, she asked me a question, you know, how do you differentiate between outputs and outcomes? And I swear, I hadn't even planned this, but it came out beautifully, I think. Ta -da. Because it, I said, outputs are what you do and outcomes are what you get everybody oh, else to do. that's smart. And Right? I mean, that's it. Ultimately, you want to have some kind of, out there has to be a tangible outcome that's going to be of benefit mm -hmm. to your business. Um, oftentimes it's sales, but there's other types of outcomes that we look for as well. Is it, you know, a lot of, you know, we're looking for increases in mind share and positioning and, and thought leadership and, and all of that stuff. So um, it is, it can be so daunting, I think, for companies, as you said, when when they don't have a ready ready made pool of what was the phrase you used? It was a great I have phrase. No idea. Communities of practice. Yeah, communities of practice. <laughs> when they don't have communities of practice, which is why it's so important to start building mm -hmm. them. And like you know, in in the when we did the um, Academy of Influencer Marketing, you know, we really talked about. Um, kind of figuring out your customer's journey and how do you help your end customer solve a problem? Well, it's through content because that's mm -hmm. our coin. And then ultimately your influencers are the ones you are hopefully motivating enough to share your content, share your message so that they are providing value to their community, who is your end audience and target customer. And it, that kind of mm -hmm. becomes the, the cycle. But it, it takes time. But it is so worth it because when you take that approach, then you're not starting from scratch every time you have a campaign. Otherwise, I mean, just that you know what it's like every time you have to to reactivate. It's cr excruciating. <laughs> it's a lot of work. It is. There's no question. It's and that's, that's something that I'm going to pitch a little here. That's something that people don't understand about influencer marketing. You don't just flip a switch and everybody lights up and supports your cause. There's a huge amount of front loaded work that has to be done. And, you know, I think that is an essential part that a lot of people forget. They think they can just go to some service and select a bunch of bloggers and they'll all put out a bunch of schlock because they're not vested. They're just doing it because they're being paid or given product. And they don't put any heart into it. And we need heart in order to really be effective at what we're doing. They've got to believe in it. Yeah. Otherwise, it's pointless. I mean, and the thing is that there are so many marketplaces now where, you know, because they'll find people like you and me and countless others who have X reach, X number of followers, blah, 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 whatever. And so they're going out there and, hey, you know, you're an influencer. Just today, somebody, well, you know, you're an influencer. Um, <laughs> and how would you like to be paid? How would you like to monetize your influence? I'm like, oh my God, people tried mm. this five years ago and it sucked. Uh, <laughs> and that's not going to stop them from trying it. Yep. You know, I get it. It's, it's going to happen. But I think that's what separates like 
the girls from the ladies. Yeah. No, where you're going with that one? Um, <laughs> I think you know the other thing that that we forget about is that let's say you want to be an influencer. You know that what you want to do is maybe influence people to enact change. For example, uh, Paula brings up something that I thought was really great. And she says, as much as an as I am an advocate for the small fish for the obvious reasons, which she isn't a small fish, by the way, I think we are also responsible for figuring out how to advocate for ourselves and explain why and how we can make a difference, even if our sheer numbers are not huge. And that is crucial to build your personal brand. It isn't about how many followers you have. It's about how many followers give a shit about what you have to say and are passionate enough about what you have to say. So in order to- Can I give you props? <laughs> yeah, no. you are. Can. Blink, 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 blink. But you know, the thing is, is that Paula in particular is very passionate about what she does. So she's a huge influencer within her circles. And she's got a lot of really big people following her in her circles. So it isn't just- Ooh, I've got lots of numbers and hundreds of thousands of followers. Having a lot of people who are influenced by what you do and being consistent with your personal brand and how you present yourself is crucially important in order to have influence and to be able, you know, to be an influencer and to be an evangelist, for example. That's my rant for the moment. Yeah. And I, and I think there are some elements, and I want to also just, uh, Gary said, <laughs> why is it always the fish who get attention? Why does no one ever talk about the small chickens or small cows? And you know what, Gary, you're totally right. So I'm all about the small chickens <laughs> and the small cows. And you know what? I'm even about the small goats because my sun sign is Capricorn, which is the goat. There you go. So now we're only going to talk about oh, the I'm an Aquarius, so we have to talk about fish. <laughs> Okay, so we'll talk about goats and fish, which is good because goats don't eat fish. So there we go. I'm glad that's cleaned up. Oh, <laughs> like just imagine if you were having this conversation <laughs> six hours later <laughs> with wine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we're, we're not even drunk right now when we're, we're so good. And it's only Tuesday. So I forgot it's where not I was even going. Friday yet. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I know what I was saying. As, as you, I think you're right. You know, it's important for the small to medium goats and fish to advocate for themselves. And that's where having systems and processes mm -hmm. comes in because this does come down. A lot of it comes down to the mechanics of what you're doing. You have to have good stuff to say or to share. And I think you really almost need to have more to share than necessarily to share, to say, at least when you start out. But I think, I think some of what drives folks crazy, um, certainly in the earlier stages is, oh my God, this is so overwhelming. You know, how do I, how do I make this manageable? And I still see a lot of businesses struggle mm -hmm. with that because they are time strapped, they're budget strapped and they are staff strapped. So they have these three big challenges of time, human power and, and resources. And they're like, Oh my God, how do we do this? So, you know, we just signed a new client for whom we're doing um, a strategy an audit and then a strategy development. But part of that is going to be training on how to set up some cost effective and efficient systems. Um, so that they don't go crazy trying to build their right. brand and build their own. Right. And, you know, that's another point that if a company wants to do social PR, I'm of the opinion, and I think you agree with me, I hope she agrees with me, that people should not try to start doing influencer outreach and social PR until they've built their own community of practice, that we know who they are and what they stand for and what their beliefs are. Not just, oh, we sell widgets, but we sell widgets that change the planet or, you know, we sell widgets that are sustainable or, you know, what are the uh, motives behind what they're trying to promote? Because now it used to be that you could just sell a widget 
and you could put an ad in a magazine or you could put up a billboard and sell that widget. But now people actually care about your company morals and your company values. And do they feel that the company is a good company to be involved with? Because there's plenty of other ones out there. So starting to put out some personality and some belief structures around that does matter to today's consumer. Whereas a long time ago, we kind of just put up with it. We don't do that anymore. We'll pitch you and go get somebody else. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Because as you, like, like you're saying, so often that's the only differentiator uh, between you and somebody else. And really, really what it, at the end of the day, there's a gazillion consultants, mm -hmm. right? People like you and me, there's any number of them. Why would somebody choose to do business with you or me or Paula or Rob or Jerry or anyone else? Mm -hmm. It's because you've built up a level of trust based on a couple of things. One, your content, I think, where you show through your content um, that you have an opinion, that you have a position on something, and it's the position that resonates with them. It may not resonate with, you know, with everyone else, but it doesn't have to. But the number two, you have social proof, and you have people saying, I think so-and-so, what he or she is saying, is is uh, Gary has a great question that I want to address mm -hmm. if we have Please. time. Um, but that social proof um, makes a difference uh, because at the end of the day, people do business with people. So it's something about you, something about me that needs to come through in our content, you know, or uh, as we talk mm -hmm. and share that they say, oh, I like that person's style. I like how they're saying this because none of what we're saying, quite frankly, at its core, none of what we're saying is new. The principles of good PR, the principles of marketing, none of mm -hmm. it is new. That's it has been around forever in our modern age, you know, since people really started thinking about it in the last hundred years or so, basically. I mean, it's been the evolution of, of this of this discipline. But so it's how you say it, I think, that is very important. It's really, really important sure. how you say it. And how other people react to it, because then that's going to give folk confidence. Oh, if they trust so and so or their content, then it must be okay. So I think, like you said, those communities of practice are really, really important. Mm. So Gary's question is: Do you think large agencies do a poor job of social PR slash influencer marketing slash whatever <laughs> we're calling it? So I don't think so, Gary. Two things: I don't think social PR is necessarily influencer marketing per se. I think there's a lot of commonality. Um, and it might be getting down to clicks and whistles <laughs> if we start to try and, and find the difference. Um, but I think there's a lot of commonality. And I think um, a community-driven approach is at the heart of social PR and a very integral part of influencer marketing as well. Um, but I hesitate to automatically say they're the same. That's, you know, just now. And we can think about it. So we should think about it because it's an interesting question. Uh, do I think large agencies do a poor job of it? In general, yes. Uh, in general, yes, because and I, I've worked at large agencies and, you know, I have a lot of friends at large agencies and um, they're wonderful people. And God bless the large agencies because they give a lot of work to smaller agencies and consultants. Uh, but they're also, they can be real, how shall I put it? Um not great places to work sometimes, despite all the glamour and the glitter of, you know, being at such and such awards program and represented at Khan and this and that. And they have, they have a, a kind of um, machine gun approach to it almost. It's like, you know, get it out, get it out, get it out. You know, what's mm -hmm. your availability? What's your utilization? Da, 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 da. I mean, I get it. That's the way they're set up. So they have to function that way. Um, but when you're just churning stuff out and you're focused so much on churning stuff out, then how and when are you going to stop looking at what's actually coming mm -hmm. from that? So I'll put on great presentations. I've been part of those. I've been put part of those new business pitches and I've been part of winning, you know, half a million dollar and larger pieces of business um, because we put on a really, really good show. But then to actually build those relationships and those communities, Invariably, I think that goes by the wayside. Well, Gary makes what saves them. 
what saves them, I'm sorry to interrupt, but what saves them is that they usually have people who are really good on good at pitching on stuff. And so they will get some significant media wins and that keeps the clients happy. Yeah, and that's the thing is that, you know, in the end, there aren't a lot of clients who respect the value of social as opposed to media hits. They want to see those numbers. They want to see things in print. They want to see accolades. They aren't always, but I think this is changing, as concerned about what the little fish or the individual consumer thinks. And, you know, that really is something that the, the corporation has to change in order for the agency to change. Because in the end, they got to make their money. Otherwise, they're not going to yep. keep the doors open. And that's why there is that push, 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 push. It's very much like working in a big Silicon Valley company. There's a lot more at stake than just are we going to be able to you know, push this one promotion? They've got a lot of promotions to push. They've got short timelines and the clients are driving to get those media hits and those numbers because otherwise you don't have any data. I think one of the hardest things about doing any kind of social is how nebulous the data can be. Uh, you know, it's like I, I put it down to the magazine in the doctor's office. If I pick up a magazine in the doctor's office and go, wow, that's a really great table. I'm going to go buy that. I'm probably going to go online and look for it. And when the uh, vendor says, how'd you find out about us? I'm going to say I found it online. I'm not going to say it was the April 1992 magazine that I found in the doctor's office. So how do we relate that to social? How do we, and you're about data as well. So I know you've got something to say about this. So I'll shut up now and you listen to you. So what do you want? But the thing is that you said, so are we talking about like how to measure more yes. accurately? So, um, well, I don't think we can, I don't think we're going to ever measure a hundred percent because it's exactly what you said, but can we measure enough to the point where it gives us insightful information that's going to help us do a better job um, and or adjust our strategy to secure those outcomes that we want. And so you've heard me say this ad nauseum, Janet, so don't roll your eyes, but you know, crack, crack, crack. So um, campaign, setting up campaign URLs through Google Analytics URL builder and goals. So between goals and campaigns, and then ultimately whatever it is, you know, however you're tracking, are you tracking sales? Are you tracking downloads? Are you tracking whatever? Are you tracking signups? Um, but it, the, just using those tracking URLs, and then if you match them with setting up goals within your analytics, that can just give you so much information. So we had a client, you were a part of this client, and um, we can't name them yet, but remember it's, it was that project we worked on uh -huh. together with the online um, educational project. And remember how to start out with, um, if Jared, Gary says, if you're really good at website tracking, you might be like royalty, but have the Duke of URLs. <laughs> Can I be the Duchess of URLs? The Duchess. Please? I don't want, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll be the Duchess of URLs if you don't mind. Say that out loud again. No, I'm not going to say that. Loud. <laughs> 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 so anyway, Remember, we had that project where it was really neat. It was a small project, but it was a lot of fun. And you handled uh, the social advertising. And we were handling the some of the content and um, traditional outreach and mm -hmm. social outreach. And because of what we were seeing in analytics, we saw the ads performing. And we didn't see the traditional outreach or the um, emails or direct mail that they wanted to send out perform mm -hmm. that much. But because we had access to the analytics and what we saw was when there was uh, uh, an, a media secured in a really niche outlet that led to significant visits and conversions. And then in the middle of it, we flipped the strategy and we said, you know, we're seeing a not the massive traditional media approach, but really focusing on the niche outlets. And second, Anytime we see digital activity, like I think we had them do a Twitter mm -hmm. chat or two, and there were a ton of visits and conversions. And we said, well, that well, worked, duh, you know, <laughs> you're, yeah, it yeah. worked really well. And so we said, well, let's just flip it. 
And so we did. And then at the second half of that project, if you remember, on our end, we flipped it so that it was almost all, you know, social interaction. So like um, finding questions on Quora for them to answer, finding groups in LinkedIn, creating, training them on how to do Twitter chats, finding influencers, but from those specific types of who were influencers for a specific type of conversation mm -hmm. to participate in those Twitter chats. And that's that's what worked. What was really interesting to me was that even though that was a pretty sophisticated client, if you remember, they were not really looking at, uh, they were not segmenting their traffic based on based on the you were on the campaign traffic. Mm -hmm. So we actually showed it to them one time and they were like, oh. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> oh, we can do that? It yeah. was awesome. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that, and that was to a large extent how we got them to agree to flipping the strategy, especially not focusing on, you know, pitching the big outlets and the big TV shows and all of that. Because and they had someone really, really um, amazing as a spokesperson. But then a trap that we often fall into, I think, all of us with these with these amazing spokespeople is that they don't have the time. They're not ready to do media. They won't do it. They'll be very selective about what they will mm -hmm. do. It's like, oh, can you tie my hands any tighter? <laughs> Well, and that is, that's an important point too. You know, it used to be that PR relied on celebrities to help pimp their products. And now it's much harder to do that because they're going to go, oh yeah, sure. I'll get in there and you can pay me a million dollars and I'll tweet once, once. Yeah. And you know that, yeah. sure, you'll hit your 2 million followers once at four o'clock in the morning. What good is that going to do us? You know, unless and 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 you might find them all in, you know, Uzbekistan <laughs> or something that won't support you. And I have nothing against Uzbekistan. Please oh, don't call me. I'll give Uzbekistan you an email here. later if you want it. So you can email her with the Uzbekistan discussion. <laughs> you know, I am not the Borat of Uzbekistan, <laughs> but um, that's how what good is that going to do you if you need people in the US or a specific market to to see your message mm. and, and to actually act that. <laughs> well, I know that, you know, we had talked about going 45 minutes here and that's almost impossible when we start having conversations because I <laughs> love talking to Shanali about this, but I also wanted to give her an opportunity to talk about social PR virtuos virtuoso, which is really, going to be awesome and it's free so pitch away girlfriend pitch away oh thank you janet i love talking to you too i feel like we should do this more often <laughs> sure. uh maybe you and i should do a separate like not that you have you know in your copious fair spree fair, blah, 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 free I time i seem to blab kind of a lot so <laughs> <laughs> so but thank you for that opportunity so socialprvirtuoso.com uh Gary has run and Paula has run and Margot has run. But if somebody is there and who doesn't mind typing in socialprvirtuoso.com into the chat stream, that's where I host my online training and my online course, which is what I opened registration for a few months ago, which has done people knock on wood have really taken to it. And the online course is um, four modules, recorded instruction, but a lot of handouts and so on. It's really kind of the A to Z of social PR. And Greg, if you're still on, then then you can. Oh, Paula, you're here. Yay. Thank you, Janet. Um, Greg can attest to that, I hope. Um, so I don't open registration. My, my course itself only accepts registration. I only accept registration for my course a few times a year. And I will be opening it soon. But I'm hosting a free training, an online micro training um, that I'm calling the Social PR Makeover. And that's going to be on May 13th, 2 to 3 Eastern. It'll be online and it's free. So if you guys go to socialprvirtuoso.com, you'll find a landing page for the training. It'll tell you what you're in for. And it's going to be a lot of fun. And we're going to do, um, I'll show you how to base, use the 7C social PR framework, which is what I've created to really audit your programs and identify what your priorities are. And we're also going to do at least one makeover live on the air. So if you have something that you want made over into a social PR scenario, shoot me a note, um, DM me on Twitter or shoot me an email. 
and we can see if you know if it's something that I can help you with and, and just kind of do the makeover live. And we're gonna have contests and, and stuff and, and it'll be fun. So two to three Eastern is just one hour of your time. It's not not a significant time investment on Friday at two o'clock in the afternoon on the East Coast or early in the morning on the West Coast or late in the evening, wherever else you need a break. So you should sign on. Please. Trust me, it's gonna be worth it. I I did go through her last mini course and it was pretty amazing. And uh, you know, any time spent you. with Shanali, you're gonna learn something. So uh oh, I'm happy you. to uh to pitch it for her as well. And you know, I really I think there's a lot to learn there. So it'll be a lot of fun. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, guys. And thank you so much for signing up, guys. Thank you, Yay, Greg. Helena signed up too. Cool. Yay. So uh, you have anything that you want to close with beyond that? You want to tell people how they can get in touch with you in case they want to complain about Uzbekistan? <laughs> so um, you can, on Twitter, I'm at Shanali. I say that shows up on the screen right there. My primary site is shanaliberg.com. So if you, you, that's where the blog lives, et cetera. So I'd love you to check that out. But really, if you've signed up for Social PR Virtual, so uh, for, the, for the makeover, then you should be getting an email once you confirm um, that directs you to the Facebook group. I have two Facebook groups. One is for um, students. That's a private group. So as and when you actually sign on for the, the course, my big course, like Greg is a part of that. Um, that's a private community where we brainstorm, where we set up our group calls and all of that. But I have another really wonderful community that's called the Social PR Posse. Janet, don't you just love the Posse? It's not an awesome community. <laughs> it's a lot of... And it's like really growing. And we only started it like four months ago. It's a lot ago. of really smart, people engaged so people. It's so smart. Mm. And like, like Rob just joined. And, you know, there's some... There are some re like everyone there is so smart. So it's free. That one is welcome. Anyone who is interested um, in the business, if you're a spammer, I will not let you in. And if you start spamming people, I will kick you out. <laughs> and I wear a size eight and a half shoes and I am partial to platform. So you do not want me to kick you out. <laughs> but otherwise, you're very welcome. It's a friendly community. We'd love to have you there. We have a lot of fun. We share some really, really great information too. So, and that's also where, by the way, once we actually get into the free training, um, you'll need to be a part of the posse because that's that's going to be the staging ground for group exercises, homework, a lot of cool things I have coming up in the next few weeks as well. So, do very join. exciting. It, it, you just go if you look I, either through the social PR uh, virtual to sign up, or if you look for the social PR posse group on Facebook, it should and pop up. And then Greg just, just posted it in the chat, group. so you can always get it there. Oh, super. And I will, so much, Greg. I'll put it on the website too so that people can uh, come back there and find it. Thank um, you. I, I want to thank you, Shanali. It's always a pleasure. And, you know, as I said, we could go on and on and on. And sometimes we do, but not today. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us. And thanks, everybody, for uh, joining us for Mindful Social. Thank you, Janet. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Oh, last thing, no mindful social next week because I'm teaching a class. So we're going to skip a week and then we'll start again, gosh, in May. How did that happen? Mm -hmm. <laughs>